Good day, everybody. Welcome into the next edition of the Bell Take. We can change it to. I kind of roll with that name now. See if it sticks. If it doesn't, tell us it sucks, and we move on to something else. Uh, but anyway, something that doesn't suck is the Phillies finally against the Florida Marlins, the uh, Miami Marlins. Miami Marlins. Uh, they they were actually pretty good when they were the Florida Marlins. They haven't had any issues since it's been the Miami Marlins. But they finally got going against the Miami Marlins, not the old school Florida Marlins because that team wasn't good enough to represent all Florida, so they had to just move them into being called the Miami Marlins. That's obviously the reason they did that. Um, but anyway, the Phillies finally got past the hump, beat them in a series. It wasn't the prettiest, but walk-off wins are also the most exciting. So you got two ways of the equation. Um, first game of the series, uh, I was very happy with what we were able to see from Aaron Nola through seven. Brogdon and uh, Sir Anthony both pitched well. And then, of course, you had the big steal and the hit for Reese in the ninth. Um, <clears throat> what was your big takeaway from that first game? I think that was one of those, like, yes, there was more opportunities to score. Maybe, like, we could have got to their pitcher, obviously, in, uh, I believe it was Alcantara early. But Alcantara is also yeah. very good. So, like, he, like, that was also the battle of, the best pitching matchup of the whole series. And I remember them saying that in pre and post. There's not much you can do when you have Noah and Alcantara both on their game. It was kind of like who got to three first would win. And obviously that ended up being the case. And luckily we were the team that did that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the Phillies did what you had to do. When you play a face a pitcher like that, all you got to do is scratch out games, find a way to win. Your, your, your pitcher's obviously going to keep you in the game. And that's what happened. And, Right when you turn to that bullpen, you have to take advantage of it, no matter who it is. And here, obviously, Miami, a struggling team, has has a bad bullpen, not the best bullpen, and that's what you're able to do. Uh, as, as you were shut down the whole game, they make that – that was an interesting switch. I thought they were going to let him ride it out with how well he was thrown, but DD comes up big off the left-hander out of the pen, and then you clear things up. Like you said, Verling has the steal, which was huge. I mean, I love the, the way the Phillies are trying to play small ball recently. And that's what happens. He gets a second. That was like old school baseball there. He gets a second there, and then Hoskins hits him in. That's that's the recipe to win, especially for this Philadelphia Phillies team who have struggled at different times and haven't had the whole group of guys playing consistent baseball yet at the same time. So, no, huge way, huge way to win, especially – and the young guys, that's what they got to do. They got to go the extra effort, find a way to get wins for your team if they want to stay up on this club. So that's what Matt did there in Verley, and he was able to get the job done. And then you had Hoskins – the hottest hitter, probably one of the hottest, if not the hottest hitter in the league right now, uh, get the get the game winning hit there, walk it off, and give the Phillies the victory. Yeah, well, they have two guys that love June because Hoskins all of a sudden is getting hot as a firecracker in June, and then Kyle Schwarber could marry yep. them up in June if it was quite possible. That's so, um, so yeah, that both of those guys are doing well, and Matt Veerling has been a changed human being uh, since Rob Thompson had taken over the team. So. And also is significantly better at fielding than Odubel Herrera. As many times as I have a chance to say Odubel Herrera sucks at fielding in center field, I will take the opportunity to say Odubel Herrera blows at fielding in center field. So hopefully Matt Veerling keeps hitting because then he'll get to start and I don't have to see. Schwarber doesn't even blow at fielding. It's more he can't get to a lot. Like what he can get yeah, to. Same with Castellanos. Yeah. Well, well, Nick does misjudge. Like I think that was bad yesterday. Like that. He also couldn't get there. He, I mean, he's got long arms. Yeah, like I, I, but also he's not the quickest in ju- I think Schwarber's a better fielder than Castellanos. I think Castellanos misjudges stuff more than Kyle, but that's just my own. I agree with that. And Kyle Schwarber's also slower, though. I think that's why Castellanos is in right and Schwarber's yeah. in left. But you might want to switch that if Castellanos continues to not get to balls in the gap and see what happens if you switch it. But uh, Veerling, I think, is helpful to have in center. So if he keeps doing what he's doing, I would kind of let him try to – I know he can move around. He's played third, he's played second, he's played first a little bit today. But if he's being able to consistently hit, I would try to leave him in center because he's able to get to the gaps pretty well when none of those guys can get to the gaps. And Odubel's not the best at getting to the gaps. And the other two that were good at it, Roman Quinn couldn't save himself to hit a lick, and then Mickey Moniak couldn't save himself. He had to hit a lick at the MLB level. So – like, those are the other two that are good at defense, but they haven't hit yet. So, and Quinn is just a lost cause, I think, at this point, where Moniak still has a chance, but needs to start hitting again at AAA and then come back up. I still have faith in Moniak, it's just he hasn't shown it yet. So, I think Veerling's your best bet at this point in center because you have to have a good fielder 
when your other two are adequate yeah. fielders at best. But um, moving into the second game, which uh, this game <clears throat> definitely goes into the category of feel bad for the starter. Um, Zach Eflin, we did find out today there was an actual reason why he came out of the game. He ended up getting seen by the doctors and everything. So at least in the end, that made a little bit more sense rather than, oh, what the heck is he not going back out for the seventh inning for? Uh, but in the same scheme of things, even if that's the case, there's a flip side that still didn't make a hell of a lot of sense. And that's why of all the people in the bullpen, I would have rather had you pitch, to be quite honest, than Yuri's familia in <laughs> yep. that situation. So that's more the big issue, I think. Now that we found out Eflin was a little bit dinged up, so it makes sense you took him out for precautionary reasons, but he's slated to still start on Sunday, apparently, from the tweet I read earlier. It, it made sense in the end. But what didn't make sense is you have Brogdon warming up earlier. Even though, yes, he pitched the day before, but I'm kind of tired of hearing that crap of, oh, the guy pitched the day before he came in. Unless if he said he couldn't get loose, that's completely different. But otherwise, you should have put him in. So um, I think you have to know how to manage. That was the first mistake Rob made, so I'm not going to get on big for it. But I think you have to know not to go to Familia there because Joe made that mistake a couple times. And I think... A, Big reason Girardi got fired was mismanagement of the bullpen. Now, Thompson's not going to ever get moved this year. He's doing a great job, but that was the first mistake he made. And I think the reason it's getting blown out of proportion by a lot is because the biggest mistakes Girardi tended to make was, I think, mismanagement of the bullpen. So the fact that it happened then, the Phillies, thank God they bounced back and won the walk-off today because it kind of got it out of people's minds. But coming into today, if you looked at the Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook sphere, some people blew it up a little bit, was for that reason. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of different things that went into that loss. I, obviously, people want to point the finger at Thompson because he put Familia in the game. But you know what? Who cares about that anymore? You got by it. I mean, that that wasn't on Rob Thompson. That game was on the players. You, you had an 8-4 to four lead. You got to trust your guy to get out there, throw, throw well enough. Whether it's one run, two runs, you're still going to be out of the inning with the lead. He, he blows up. Then you bring in Dominguez. He gives up a run. I'm not ripping on Dominguez. He's been nothing but excellent this year. But then even after all that, you come back and take the lead on a high concern run, and then your closer, Kniebel, blows the save. So to me, I mean, in the end, was Thompson – should you have put Familia in? Probably not. Who are you going to go to, though? Bilotti? That, that's where the question comes in there. Who else are you going to go with there? But, again, I'm going to point the finger to the players because even with that, what happened in the ninth inning? You had an error, error by Ockbaum. You had an error by JT Real Muto. You had mismanaged ball, whether you want to say, uh, like you mentioned, a bad route to the ball, or he just couldn't get there because he's not fast enough. And Nick Castellanos, he should have caught the ball. So all said and done, should he put Familia? Maybe not. But in the end, that loss is on the players. They need to go out there and field the ball. They need to go out there and do their job. That's not the, – the the bad mismanage for me from the, from the managers is when – his base is loaded, and he brings in Familia over Dominguez or, or something like that. That's where it's kind of like, okay, you need to be better at that. But you're bringing in Familia in a clean clean inning, I mean, with a four-run lead. I, I get well, I he hasn't been good, but I, I, don't, I don't take issue with that, if I'm being honest. That, that's yeah. when you want to bring him in. Well, that's when you would want to put him in. I think we're getting to the borderline of you're a lost cause, you're familiar, you just suck, get designated for assignment if this keeps happening. And that's a different story, but that's where so, you got to start calling out Dave. And maybe here's the thing. Maybe they they pull Alvarado situation with familiar. They just sent uh, uh, Jose Alvarado to AAA. Now he's back up. I think yesterday or, or Monday they called yeah, him back up. I don't know. Can they so do maybe, that with maybe, I don't know why they wouldn't be. Aren't they similar? What was it? I don't know. I just don't know if he, because I don't know how it would work contractually. I don't know how it's like if he has to go through. Oh uh, yeah, on the contract. I, I, so that obviously depends. Do they play an injury card? Oh, you need to go on the 15 today IL for a little bit. We've seen that in the past. That's which they true. might honestly do with Corey Knievel as well. Uh, well, he's actually been saying they've he's at. Then that's that's where I actually would have questioned Rob Thompson with in the post game if I was a reporter there, which I didn't, they didn't really fully ask him. They indirectly did, but listen, Corey Knievel has been having arm arm soreness. They said the last couple of days, and he's had three days off. He clearly didn't seem right. I'm not saying. That's why he did bad no, because of his arm injury. But that seemed a little bit interesting there. Is three days later, after having bad arm soreness and couldn't close the game out, you're going to put him in, and that's in a one-run game. That seemed a little fishy to me. And he, you could 
tell, obviously. He didn't have the right stuff there. So there's a lot of different things that went into that loss. Thompson, I, I guess, for, from different standpoints, was an issue a little bit. But the familiar one, that's more you got to just get him off the team at this point. Yeah, yeah, I I think so too. Um, I was looking at it. Uh, his, if you look at Bellotti and Nelson, their numbers are far better than Familia's that are not named pitchers. Like Familia's the name brand. Brand doesn't really matter when you're not succeeding, when the other two guys are performing better. Where where Nelson's been more of just that steady middle reliever that you expect, like a four three ERA out of a middle reliever that eats like say I don't know by the end of the season seventy or more innings. Where Velotti has actually been the more impre- the most impressive of the class because he came off of being out of baseball for a while because of that car accident, has a cool comeback story after having an unfortunate event in his life. Uh, and if he continues to do that, I would say you might as well put him into bigger situations because you did end up having to throw him into a bigger situation, anyway, which he almost got out of, but like you said, because of fielding mishaps. That didn't help him out at all. So I think he's shown he's one of those guys that kind of keeps it at the same heart rate level in those pressure situations. So to have a guy like that, that's not the biggest name brand, but to find them like the A's, Cardinals, and other teams tend to do, the Phillies don't tend to do that. So it was nice to find somebody like that. But Mark Appel, I've been saying for a while, he's been doing good. He's not a big name either. He was a big name in 2011. Now in 2022, not so much, but I think he's a guy I would give a chance to because he's dominating. I think it's 18 games now with Lehigh. He's been dominating in, and you might, it, it's not a lose situation either way because if he comes up and stinks, you're just going to put him back with Lehigh. So there's no loss yeah. situation there. So I feel like if Familia continues to struggle, you got to just kick him down the road and see what Mark Appel can do with how sharp he's been. Cause ever since he's moved fully to the pen and not this kind of back and forthness this season, he's been really sharp. So I think you might as well try to take advantage of that. He wouldn't be the first reliever to be a starter to reliever to get going at age 28, 29. I'm pretty sure Brandon Morrow was like 28, 29 when he got going as a reliever. So like he wouldn't be the first guy to do it. So I would say give, you might as well give that a shot. Yeah, no, I hear. You. I mean, there's a lot of different options. Obviously, um, no, yeah, there's a lot of different options you have down the mine. I mean, obviously, we saw the Phillies went out to look at Trevor Rosenthal scouts, or when he was throwing, we had a scout there. So we'll see. Maybe that is a possible option. You know, some trade options here in the near future. So there's gonna be a lot of options. It's just a matter of getting to the point there before Familia is done. But listen, th- these games, you throw it in the back window and hope to move on. And obviously, we'll get in there game three shortly. But that's exactly what this team did. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think when it comes to game three, the big thing for me was Kyle Gibson, who I forgot to put in for my damn fantasy. Team, but anyway, that's not important. Uh, Kyle Gibson uh, pitched uh, really well again and got the no decision, which is unfortunate for him. Uh, but uh, he pitched really well into the ninth inning. And I think I've liked how Rob kind of seems to have Yes, he'll use the stats he's given, but does have, which I kind of really wanted in our manager for why, that old school mentality of if you're just going, I'm riding, I don't care if you're at 86 pitches in the analytics, say to take you out 86 pitches. Like, I do like that side that I've kind of seen from him in the first, whatever it is now, 12, 13 games that he's managed. You know, I completely agree. And that's what I thought was interesting yesterday when he took Eflin out. I was like, that's that. Like, I honestly like didn't. It was like, I know it's only quote managed 11 games to yesterday's point, but I was like, that's not a Rob move. He's been leaving guys in left and right for a while and, and stretching them out. So I, I, right away, I was like, that that seems really odd. So it didn't surprise me, honestly, especially with his injury history, too, that Eflin was dealing with a little bit of a, a arm sore, or sorry, knee soreness there because I felt something was up just because that isn't something you usually see from Rob. And like you said, today he, he rode Gibson, and it's a shame. I was a little surprised they pulled him after that one hit in the ninth. I get you wanted to keep that one around game. I just thought they'd give it him a, another at-bat or something like that. So – that one even surprised me here this afternoon. But, hey, in the end, he rode Gibson. Gibson threw phenomenal. Like you said, unfortunately, he couldn't get the win. But these pitchers, the starting pitching has been excellent this year. It's really just – and so the offense is coming around too. It's really just figuring out your bullpen now. And I get it. They only scored three runs today. But you're going to have those type of games. But they've still found a way to win. That's what matters. And, again, kind of like game one. I know 
it wasn't as good of a pitcher as game one, but they did the same thing. Your starting pitcher kept you in the game. You battled, you battled. You had opportunities. I mean, I don't know if, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but at least for me, with how hot the offense was, it was like, okay, we keep getting base runners. One of these times, you're going you're gonna to find a way to score. And it wasn't the, it wasn't the yeah, most today, obvious yeah. choice, but it was, uh, it was, I mean, okay, here's the thing. You got the hits. I mean, you think about it. Harper came up, runner on third, nobody out. He didn't come through. Castellanos did the same. He didn't come through. So you had opportunities throughout that game to score. You just couldn't get them in. And then again, not the, not the, not everyone's most predictable piece to hit the walk off home run and be the hero. But in the end, it doesn't matter who hits it as long as somebody does. But I'll tell you what, that the excitement, and this is one of the things I've noticed with Rob is the excitement from the players after a game mm-hmm. like that has been top notch next level. And I'll ask you this question because Craig, from I was telling somebody about this the other day, it might be my brothers or something, but in all honesty, I haven't seen, there's been a couple times, I haven't seen a whole lot different wise in terms of game situation managing from Rob and Joe. The big thing I've noticed is the energy of the team. Like that's yeah, what, that's, and I think that's what's pitching, funny. To I me. think he has a little bit more faith, like you said, in the starter. That's yeah. the other side. You hinted at that earlier. I would say he has a little bit more old school faith in the starter. Like you're the guy I put out there to start the game for a reason. If you still have gas in the tank, I'm riding you as the horse of the team, basically. Which that's a more of an old school take on things. But I like that. So. Yeah, no, I agree. My point is, like, he's still using Familia in that 3-4 run game just like Joe did. He's still using – I mean, obviously, he now today they'll probably go closer by committee, but he was still using Corey up to this point as the closer. He was still using Dominguez as, in hand as the eighth inning get out of a jam situation. So that's that's my point is, like – and he's still having Kyle lead off, Hoskins sitting second. I mean, I, I get it. He is playing the young guys a lot more, but my thing is – He's kind of forced to with the Gene injury and everything. Uh, so I'll, I'll be interested to see when Gene comes back, what he's going to do with the Bryson Stott, the Matt Verling, uh, and everything. But, again, my biggest difference, I think, is whatever he's doing behind the scenes. We've heard from veterans about the communication skills. So, obviously, that's going into a lot of it. So, it's all to me, it's not even necessarily the in-game decisions that he's making being the big things. It's the whatever he's doing behind the scenes with communication and, and just letting these guys enjoy it and – it looks like they're finally having fun playing baseball again. Yeah, and I also think the bounce back of Alec Boom has been something we haven't seen in a while. Like he made the bad fielding play yesterday, comes out today, makes a ridiculous play down the third base yep. line that most players would not make because, one, they don't have the lankiness to reach out that far to make it. But, two, it's also just a hard play to make in general. Uh, and I think he's really has more confidence than ever because to be able to have that bounce back, have the hits he had today – Uh, have the solid base running. Uh, He's starting to also become at least adequate. Like, yes, he makes those mistakes that we can highlight, but I think with Boehm, it's also, he's one of those guys at this point when he makes one defensive mistake, we're like, oh, sweet Jesus, holy good Lord. Like, because of what he was before. So, like, I feel like now he's actually adequate, but whenever he makes one mistake, everyone's like, oh, my God, the world is ending, the sky is falling, where is Chicken Little? Like, so, like, (laughs) I feel like that's pretty much where the like mindset is of the fan base so where with me i'm always like, like i was texting my one friend about it like i'm confident in bone still because of his bounce back if you can have bounce back quickly for me that's what i want to see in an athlete if you're somebody that's like sitting there like this the whole time or like like for example how no 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 don't get me wrong i like cody bellinger a lot but how cody bellinger looks in a lot of the memes like he's high as seven kites and hitting 170 uh like like that's not necessarily what I want to see it would be a lot funny if he was hitting 420, but you know, he, he would have to take a while to get there. Right. Um, but wh- when it comes to the Phillies, I'm confident with the way they're going. I don't want to get though, because of our bullpen, I still see some flaws there, which is a big thing when you want to be the best you can be in the end. If you're having a good offense, getting better at fielding or big key components, but I would say a third key component about being as good as you really possibly can be is making sure your bullpen is the anchor it needs to be and not having, I don't know what the right word to, would be, but like holes in the in yeah. the rope, basically, or holes in the anchor. Like, I, I, I would say 
that's the issue I have going forward. The team is the starting rotation has been impressing me more and more each outing for each pitcher. And there's a couple guys in Lehigh that have been looking really good out of the bullpen, like Mark Appel, for example. So I feel like you could shift those. Ryan Sheriff is a lefty is also. So if Alvarado continues to suck, he's probably going to be out of a job. <laughs> but could yeah. Sheriff is starting with single A and working his way back up. And he's usually been a solid control sinker ball, double play lefty. And that's kind of what you need more than Jose Alvarado in Citizens Bank Park is the only way Jose's good in CBP is if he strikes a lot of guys out. If he's not striking a lot of guys out, he gives up a lot of fly balls, and that's not good for Citizens Bank that's Park. True. So I think that's my biggest concern. I don't want to get ahead of myself yet because I've done, we've done that too much in years past with Joe Girardi or Gabe Kapler. But I like the direction the team's definitely going under Rob Thompson, and I think it's just Dave. It's now on Dombrowski to fill out the rest of the pieces, which if he's not blind – should see that the bullpen is one of the biggest things that he might want to fill out a relief piece as soon as he can. He knows what he's doing. I'm not worried. It's just you got to get to the all-star break the way you have. You don't see many trades before the all-star break. You'll see them happening. And there's going to be guys out there. I'll tell you what, former Philly, former Philly great David Robertson, he's going to be out there uh, with the Chicago Cubs. He's having a phenomenal year. If you haven't paid attention to him, go look his stats up. He's been unbelievable. Cubs have hit their tough spot. Tough spot. I think they've dropped. He was good for USA. He was good yeah, for Team USA too before he came back. And yeah, he, they've dropped their nine last last ten, so there'll be sellers at the market or yeah, sellers at the market. So I I, again, I can't imagine his contract being that big. So I don't think he'll be that. I think he'll be pretty cheap. He'll be an option. So there's gonna be guys out there, and like you mentioned, you got some in-house options as well. So I, I'm excited to see. You just gotta keep finding ways to win. You got another. You're obviously not going to win five. Or I say obviously, but maybe pull off the miracle. But you're most likely not going to win five games against the same team in the stretch against Washington. You just got to make sure you take at least three, probably even four against them, and and, and go go from there. So it's going to be a fun battle. And Friday, I think we're going with Suarez and barely falter as the starters for that doubleheader, which uh, will be interesting uh, in that case, obviously, calling him up. And you find a way to win at least one of them, and then you take the others. This team's fine. And I keep telling people, I don't know, you're a big baseball guy, obviously. I don't know if you're the same way. I don't even really care about the standings until the All-Star break. I mean, it fluctuates so much. That, that to me, is the first benchmark in terms of standings. Is where you're at the All-Star break. Think about it. We were, we were like eight back of the wild card, 13 back of the division. Everyone's gone crazy. And then all it takes is one stretch in baseball. Now you're right back in the playoff yeah. race. You're one game above 500. If you can find a way to chip another two or three games off and get down to four, five, even six games behind the Mets uh, here at the at the All Star break, you're gonna be right in the race in the second half, especially with the schedule you have uh, in that second half. I know we didn't do well with the schedule last year when you had basically the same thing, but you got a lot of different guys and bigger horses in there now. So I, I think you're gonna go a long way uh, in terms of that. So I, I'm excited, and again. That that's where you really look at the standings and all, finding where a team's at. In my eyes, is where are you at the All Star break? Are you 15 back? Are you five back? It's always still playable. Look at look at the Braves, and Nationals, and the two years they won the World Series. Yeah, and I would say for us it matters more at the wild card because I would say it's going to take a pretty good feat with the unless if the Mets fall like they tend to do sometimes, but they would have to fall off of a Everest level cliff if they keep going up the mountain that they're going. So I would say it's probably going to be a wild card where, for me, both of my teams that I tend to follow, because as most people know, I follow the channel from going to Boston, my dad going to business trips, so the second team I follow the most, sucked for the first two months. And would then just like, hey, you know what, guys? Baseball is what the hell we're supposed to be playing. I thought we were playing badminton. It's like, no, you weren't. It's like, so, like, that. that's pretty much how both of the teams that are now both are above 500. I think the Sox are like 33 and 29, and the Phillies are one above at 32 and 31. So, like, it, it, teams, t- that just goes to prove it exactly what you were saying. Teams tend to go in waves and tides. Uh, if you want to use a cross sport, the St. Louis Blues are the worst freaking team in hockey or were the third worst in the beginning yep. of the season when they won the Stanley Cup. Get Craig Berube and then win the Stanley Cup with a guy that was in the ECHL a year before. So different crazy things happen in the world of sports. Um, so I think that just goes to show with you have to wait to see how things play out. But yeah, I'm not too worried. I think Dave knows what he needs. I think it's more 
they need to make sure they don't overthink. Like the Phillies have had a tendency to overthink things in the past. Just get the best guy for you. You already saw with Andrew Bellotti how well he's fit, how well Nick Nelson, Nick Nelson's not a name brand pitcher by any stretch of the imagination. He's been a pretty good middle reliever for you. So, like, if, if, if that's starting to work, I would hope they realize we don't have to go for, oh, my God, this guy's the biggest name. Like, like if you yeah. got for Kim, well, fine. But, like, you don't have to go for that. You just have to go for somebody that's doing tough and doing well. Like David Robertson wouldn't be a big name anymore because he's 38 or whatever he is and exactly. goes away from the game for a little bit, came with USA, started doing well again. Uh, he's a guy that would kind of fit into the realm because then you're not – I almost think those guys are better for Philly because then you're not having people, if they struggle a little bit, going, oh, my God, Craig Kimball's struggling. The sky is falling and the world yeah. is in. Like, so it, it almost so kind you, of works out better. Would you trust Dominguez to be your every, everyday closer? Like, Given time, yeah. Uh, now it would be – I would have to wait and see how he is if he gets more extended because I feel like – I know I responded to somebody on Twitter earlier. I feel like he should get more extended time, like a lot of extended time in the role. And then from that, if he looks really good, then, yeah, I would say he should get the role continuously. But right now, I would say 70% because he's looked really good otherwise. But you can't know how a guy's going to be in that role necessarily until they're fully – so did you go Dominguez hand or just straight up matchups? I would probably I think they're gonna do matchup base, but if somebody's really hot, which I think would be Sir Anthony over Brad Hand, no offense to Brad Hand, he's been pitching fine. Obviously he's been pitching good, but Brad Hand's not the same Brad Hand he was in twenty sixteen. So I feel like Dominguez no, is they, sent, they, so. outside one hiccup past week, they both have been absolutely on fire. Oh yeah, yeah. I just think if Dominguez continues to ascend, he hasn't even hit his prime yet, where Brad Hand right. obviously has. So if he's hot, I feel like you have to roll as there's a loud ass plane going over it. I feel like you have to roll with uh, Sir Anthony. Um, but if he's like bugabooing a little bit, then yeah, you can go with Hand. I think the other guy you might see in there is Brogdon a little bit. Because yep. it kind of reminds you of Ryan Madsen and the way he uses that change up a lot to the fastball and everything. So I wouldn't be surprised if he mixes in. I wouldn't put Alvarado in there until you could see if Alvarado can even pitch in any other situation yet. So he would he would be a guy who would be pissed off and tweeting about as soon as he gets put in in the ninth inning. It, it does, even if it worked out in the end, I would be like, okay, cool, don't do that again. I would be like that basketball coach I used to have. Like, it's like, no, 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 no. Oh, never mind. That went in. Do you ever shoot that shot again? Like, so, like, that would be how I would be if Alvarado actually got the save. But, no, I think, but wrapping up uh, the show, I would say, like, we talked about Gibson did great. Uh, Garrett Stubbs, I think he's been the best backup performing catcher thus far. He hasn't had to be in every game, but when he has, he's catch Gibson immensely. Uh, he's a field first guy that was always hitting in triple A and double A when it came to Houston's organization. Now all of a sudden he's been hitting in the bigs. Um, so I think the Phillies kind of just, they, they got two guys. We don't normally luck out with these types of things of getting guys in the right year where they're going to take off, but they got two guys and it seems like with Bilotti and the pen coming with his comeback story. And then Stubbs with, this is kind of the year he's going to show this is my full backup season. And then you could probably grow from there potentially. Obviously, we have JT, so example, but like I'm talking about in general around the league, his reputation would then grow and all that. So it, I think he's definitely doing well for himself and doing well for the team at the same time. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. And he's been huge, and he gives you the chance to, to give a guy like JT an off day here and there. So no, I'm excited for what he's been able to do, keep this team afloat, and uh, you know, keep going from there. And Logan ohoppy has been tearing. Anytime I put on, go to the writing stuff to see highlights, it's like, oh, look, Logan Ohoppy hit another double or home run. Uh, so yeah. you have him tearing it up. Donnie Sands is hitting well. Uh, Mark Hahn's injured, so you can't really do, do much on uh, him. Uh, Austin Wins is just a defensive catcher in the minor, so there's not really the, – that's just that. <laughs> but – I think in the catching prospects, you have Ohapi, you got Sands. I think they're also pretty good. I don't obviously want to see Garrett Stubbs, or, but like the Phillies have the most depth they had at catcher in a while, almost like the Flyers have the most depth at goaltending they had in a while. So I think that definitely is really going to help them out. They also have that other guy, I'm blanking on his name right now, 
I, I don't know why, but like there's this other guy in the minds that's been with us forever that is a straight up great fielding catcher. The only problem is he can't hit a freaking <laughs> lick that well. That's why he's probably not gonna make it unless he makes it as like an AJ Ellis. But I can't remember his name right now. But we also have a guy like that that's really good for the minors, but I don't think he'll make it to the bigs unless if he starts hitting. But okay. no, yeah, I've been very excited with that. Veerling, I've been excited with what he's been able to do. Stott, even Shane when uh I had him on earlier in the week. Uh, got to reunite with Shane for a podcast. Um, he talked about how Stotts, and I think he was spot on too, how Stott puts together better at bats than the stats show. Uh, and he has been doing that. So I think over time, his stats, just like Veerlings, are starting to creep up, uh, will naturally yeah. start to creep up. But on, to- on that topic, if you wanted to share out that podcast so people knew where to listen, because I know you, Shane and Biscuit have a podcast too. So if you wanted to give the link or share out what that's called, so people can go follow that. That's, you can find that on Spotify, Apple podcasts, wherever you want, want to find it. Uh, so you can think you, so you think you can manage podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Shane and I were talking about that. So I figured I'd give you like I did with Shane a chance to yeah. share that one out. Uh, and then we thank everyone for uh, joining. Did you have any other closing thoughts you wanted to wrap up on the team in this edition of the Bell Take? Uh, we're back. The Phillies are back. We're going to keep going, keep riding this hot stretch. I think this team's going to keep going, so don't give up on them yet. It, it keeps, uh, that cr- the crowd's been pretty good, I feel like, lately. Obviously, the day game today is obviously tough to get out there. That's people working, but, but uh, what? No, that's different. I don't count day games. When yeah. it comes no, that's what I'm saying. It's tough to get out there, so no. Keep keep showing out. I think it's been pretty good crowd here the last few games and everything. And I'm excited for the direction the season's turning. Yeah, I completely agree. Everybody have a great, safe, pleasant day. Hopefully the Phillies keep riding and swinging the bats into the right direction as they go on a bus ride down to D.C. I would assume <laughs> they're taking a bus. It wouldn't make sense to fly. Uh, and they're going to start a five-game series with a doubleheader on Friday against the Washington Nationals. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe. For Andrew Santangelo, I'm Joe Boric. Peace, everybody, and enjoy the baseball.